Well, thank you, everybody, for being here tonight. Uh, certainly, there's a lot of other places you could be, uh, especially uh, when you look outside and uh, just see what a what a beautiful day it is. And I mean, as you know, we don't get too many of those, so <laughs> we take advantage of them when when we do get them. So certainly appreciate uh, each and every one of you being here. Uh, we'll start with. Uh, with a hymn, we'll uh, we'll do that one that uh, that Kelly was just playing. What a friend we have in Jesus! And I've actually uh, just coming up. I'm uh, I'm not a song leader myself, so I told her now play really loud so people hear you and not me. So <laughs> we'll see how things go. So that's uh, hymn number two forty four. What a friend we have in Jesus, and we'll. Uh, We'll stand and just uh, stretch our legs a little bit with hymn 244. That's good singing tonight. Uh, you can be seated. If, uh, if there are any announcements, I haven't been told them, so <laughs> not much help in that regard. Uh, I do know just um, from, from some things that I've heard, uh, the renovations out in Carbonair uh, seem to be going well. It sounds like they're uh, busy, uh, as you would expect. Of course, uh, I believe that's where the Homans are. Uh, tonight, someone can correct me if I'm wrong on that one. And uh, of course, we have uh, Pastor and Mrs. Smith are, are visiting with Carbonair and helping them do their renovations. So uh, keep them uh, in your prayers as they work and uh, get some things done around the church building out there. And by way of announcements, that's that's all I have. Uh, like I said, we'll do uh, we'll do one more song and then we'll uh, we'll get into the message tonight. We'll do hymn number 309. I think I have that one right. <laughs> so we will do hymn 309, There is a Fountain. Uh, we'll do maybe not, uh, maybe not all the verses tonight, maybe just 1, 3, and 5. And uh, you can stay seated where there is a fountain.
singing again tonight. We'll uh, turn in our Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and we'll take a moment to pray once, uh, once we land there. First Corinthians chapter 12, and when you, uh, when you find that, we'll be beginning in uh, verse 12, but just before that, we'll, uh, uh, we'll pray, and then I'll uh, tell you who I am, <laughs> just in case there's anyone who, uh, who, who maybe doesn't know me, so uh, we'll just jump in with a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we do thank you for this opportunity to, uh, to gather together. We thank you for each one uh, who has made the effort to be here tonight, and again, who has uh, chosen to be here tonight when there are so many other things we could be doing. We thank you for your word and uh, just your desire to uh, communicate with us and your desire for us to uh, know your word and to study your word. And as we do that tonight, uh, we pray that uh, we would do so with uh, uh, open hearts and just uh, hearts that are uh, ready to learn and, and willing to learn and, and eager to learn. And we just ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right. Um, my name is uh, Mark, uh, Mark Squibb, of course, uh, as most of you would know. I usually sit in that uh, back row right there, usually next to uh, this very pretty lady up front who's usually sitting back there with me. Uh, she was also playing tonight uh, along with Kelly. I think that was, again, to help drown me out so you would hear them instead of me. But um, Claire and I married this summer, and uh, she's moved down here from Ontario. I'm from Carbonair originally, and don't, don't hold that against me. <laughs> no. we, uh, as my nan would say if, if she were here, you know, Carbonier is the best place. That's what she says when she crests over the hill and, and sees Carbonier coming up over the horizon. So uh, from Carbonier originally, know uh, the folks out in Carbonier really well. Uh, just with work over the years, lived in Clarenville for a couple of years, went to the church there, uh, went to the church in Labrador for, uh, for a summer, and then again due, uh, due to work, land at... Uh, Land it with all of you here at uh, here at first. That was 2018, maybe. It, it gets a bit hard with uh, with the the COVID trying to remember how long things were ago because you know COVID feels like it lasted a month, but it also feels like five years. So it was a couple of years back that uh, that I joined with uh, with you folks here. So we're, uh, we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 tonight, and we're going to be studying uh, the concept of uh, the body uh, of Christ, of the local church, and um, I don't have a snappy, snappy title, so uh, certainly I think the, the body uh, will do, because that's uh, what we're looking at tonight. We'll begin reading in verse 12 of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, Paul writes, For as the body is one, and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been 
all made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body as it hath pleased him. And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are they many members, yet but one body. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more than those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable... Upon these we bestow more abundant honor, and our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked. That there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all members suffer with it, or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. And it's a familiar uh, passage for, uh, for many of us, uh, one in which the Apostle Paul, uh, as, he was, uh, as he was wont to do, uses a, a, a simile or a metaphor uh, to bring out a spiritual truth. In this case, uh, of course, comparing the body of Christ, the local church as is gathered here tonight, to an actual physical human body. And there's a reason for Paul uh, to do this. He's bringing out spiritual truths by making these uh, comparisons. And we'll get into this just a little bit uh, later in the night but if we look at the, the first 11 verses, which uh, we won't take time to read through them all, uh, there's a bit of a, a controversy in the church at Corinthian. Well, there's a lot of controversies at the church at Corinth, as you would know, uh, reading through the book. Uh, but there were disagreements and there were divisions about spiritual gifts and the roles that people played in the church and there were arguments about the roles that people fulfilled and, and what they did in the church and their their active part in the ministry which is why Paul brings forward this metaphor and so the first point of, of, of Paul's uh, comparison here which we see in, in verses 12 through 15 is there is one body but many members. And I mean, it's just like our own natural, physical, human bodies. I mean, we all have different body parts that make up our body. And it's, it, sounds, it sounds simple when, when you say it like that because it's something that we, we all know, we're all aware of. We have... Uh, our, our hands, our feet, our, our bones, our, our skin, our teeth, all of these different body parts make up our unified whole. And that's the same with the local church, is what Paul is saying here, that each member of a local church is like a different part of a body, and taken together as a whole, each member together makes up the combined whole of the body. And there's no one person in the church who's more deserving to be a part of the church than any other member. There's no, uh, no one in the ministry who's uh, more deserving to be in the ministry than any other member. We're all a part of the same uh, body. It's, it's much like, uh, like salvation, of course. There's no uh, one person who is more 
deserving of salvation uh, than another. Uh, of course, the Bible teaches uh, in Romans 3 that all have sinned, all have come short of the glory of God. We all uh, deserve uh, condemnation and we all deserve uh, punishment, but again, because of God's grace, because of his salvation, you know, we're able to, to escape that condemnation, not, not because of any worthiness of our own, but of course because of the grace of God, which is bestowed equally on, on all those who will, uh, who will believe. And we see that, uh, that here in the church. As we see, uh, uh, if we look down in verse, uh, verse 13 uh, through 14, um, we see different categories of people who may be in the church. And uh, I mean, all throughout history, you, you don't have to look very far to see this. People are sometimes treated differently based on, you know, what category of person we put them on. Or, you know, people are treated differently based on their nationality or their, their race or their gender their, or their age. There's, you know, there's all sorts of things that people judge people based on. And we see two examples of that here. Uh, it says, you know, whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, you know, your, your nationality, or whether you're, you're bond or free, and that would more or less relate to your social status, you're all uh, baptized and made to drink of one spirit. And it's a reminder for us that, you know, the Jew isn't better than the Gentile in the church, or the bondman isn't uh, better than, than the free man. You know, our, our standing in the church, our position in the church, our part uh, in the body of the church isn't more or less depending on our family or where we come from or the things that we accomplish or how society views us. Those things don't determine our worth in the body of, of believers. And Paul uh, touches on this again in Galatians chapter 3, uh, starting in verse 26, just uh, two verses, you, you don't need to turn there. Uh, for ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male or female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And now when we read that, we understand, uh, you know, that, that's not saying that there, are, there aren't different roles in the church that are fulfilled uh, differently. You know, that's not saying that men and women don't play different roles in the church. It's not saying that uh, younger people and older people uh, don't have different roles in the church. It's just saying that your position in the church, your worth to the church isn't based on, on your gender or your race or where you come from. We're all baptized into the one body, the one uh, spirit, it says. And that really leads into uh, the second point. You know, as we see that, you know, nobody in this body is more important than another person based on those factors. Uh, we see that there are many members and also many jobs, verses uh, 15 through 24. And of course, Paul talking about the body, he, Paul I think has a, uh, I think he has a sense of humor that, that sometimes we don't quite give him the, the credit for. He, he can be a little bit uh, sarcastic, almost a little bit facetious at times. And I think he's being purposefully a little bit ridiculous with how far he takes this metaphor because, you know, he, he says, well, if, if the foot says that he's not the hand, is he not a part of the body? And then uh, later, 
you know, the eye can't say to the hand, I, I have no need to, of thee, or, or the head can't say to the feet, I have no need of thee. I mean, it, it, it's kind of silly. And I think Paul is doing that really to bring out the point of that's kind of what we're like sometimes in the body. Uh, now, my, my wife and I are... Uh, we're due in September, of course, most of you, you know, so uh, we do have a baby on the way. We're very excited about that, and of course, one of the things you do when you have the baby on the way is you go to the ultrasound, so uh, we've had some of those done, and of course, our last one, uh, the baby was a little bit more formed, and uh, you know, you're excited, and you look at all of those uh, different body parts that you can see and and the doctor was you know looking and, and marking things off and uh, you know okay there are ten fingers ten toes uh, you know there's the, the the spine and the heart and the liver and and, and all of that and um, you know it, it's just amazing to see uh, to be able to see all that and, and those body parts are important because if you know we looked in and you know, baby only had eight fingers, um, you know, we know that that was something we had to deal with uh, with later. So we're looking at all of these parts, and even the smallest parts have a, they have a purpose. They have a, a part to play. And that's the same here in the church. Each member, big or small, uh, and of course, that's that's not not your size, <laughs> but each member has a role to play. Each member is important. Each member is valuable. Uh, you know, if if your body was missing a part, if you lost a limb, or if you lost, uh, you know, one of your your senses, you have to learn to work around that because all of your body parts are important, and, and it's sort of. Uh, you know, if you want to step away from the, the body metaphor for a minute, you think of uh, something like a hockey team. Uh, now, of course, uh, you probably heard that the uh, uh, Colorado just won the, uh, the Stanley Cup, and of course that's a big deal here because uh, Alex Newhook is from St. John's, so uh, I'm sure there will be, there, there's already talks of the, uh, the parade, you know, on George Street for the night, so can only imagine the money <laughs> that those bars will make that night. But, you know, a, an NHL team doesn't win a Stanley Cup just based on one player. Uh, now, myself, I'm a, uh, I'm a New York Rangers fan. They didn't win the Cup, obviously. Uh, but they did, they almost did, if that counts for anything. Um, 32 teams in the NHL the easiest way to say it is they came in the top four. They, they reached the, the, their Eastern Finals, and then they didn't go on to the Stanley Cup Finals. So they, they got to the top four. So that's, that's pretty good out of 32 teams. But the reason they were able to do that, again, it's not just based on the strength of one or two players. It's every player playing their own role and doing their duty and doing the things that they're expected to do. Uh, they have a really great goalie who kind of became a great goalie out of nowhere. <laughs> he wasn't supposed to be this uh, incredible talent that he is, but uh, you know, they have that goalie. They have four or five you know, all-star players, we'll call them. They have uh, some really good defensemen and you know, further down the line, they have a lot of scoring depth. They have a good coaching staff. And all of those different factors come together and make a good hockey team. And it's the same way here with believers. We all have different talents. We all have different abilities. Uh, there are things that some people can do that other people can't do. And that's fine. We're not, uh, we're not called to do everything uh, in the church. Uh, I mean, I, I, I don't mind speaking, but if you have an electrical problem with your panel box, don't call me. I don't, I, I wouldn't know what to do. Um, you can ask me to pray about something, and I can do that. Don't ask me to sing a solo, because 
<laughs> I, I probably wouldn't do it, and if I was really hard pressed and had to do it, you probably wouldn't enjoy it. So let's we we we'll avoid that. But that's okay. I I don't need to, you know, sing solos. I don't need to fix the uh, electrical problems. Those aren't my skills. Those aren't my talents. That's not what I'm good at. Maybe if I had some training or some time to study it or dedicate to it, maybe I would learn to do those things. But right now, I'm pretty hopeless, pretty helpless when it comes to that kind of stuff. So that's just your heads up. If you need anything like that done, I'm not the one for it. And again, that's okay because, you know, as Paul says, your eye, basically what he's saying, your eye doesn't smell, your feet don't, I was going to say your feet don't smell, I guess. your feet don't sniff, your feet don't look the same way an eye does because that's not their job. I mentioned uh, work earlier, I've been working with uh, newspapers the last uh, number of years. And in your typical newspaper office, there are a lot of people with, uh, with different jobs. You have your reporters who, uh, you know, they do interviews and they attend meetings and then they, they write stories and take pictures and that sort of thing. Uh, you have an editor who then reads those stories and tries to make sense of it and make it better and <laughs> fix all the, the grammar mistakes. Uh, you have salespeople who Call, uh, call businesses and book ads and take payments and that sort of thing. You have graphic artists who uh, design ads and place ads on pages and, and lay the paper out and that sort of thing. Um, you have a, a, a plant where the paper is actually printed and, and you have uh, guys who are working the press and actually getting the physical copy out. You have a delivery man that goes around and drops it off wherever it needs to go. So there's a lot of people doing a lot of different things to make that one product. Now, if I went into my office one day and everybody decided, well, I want to be a reporter for the day, or everybody was going to be a salesperson that day, things wouldn't get done. Or if one person decided, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be the reporter, but I'm also going to take sales calls, and I'm also going to design the ads, and I'm also... I'm going to do the deliver. I'm going to do it all. They also wouldn't get it done because they would overwhelm themselves and they wouldn't do a good job trying to do everything. And that's again, that's like us. It's okay if you don't uh, sing in the choir. If that's not your what you feel is your talent or what you feel you're comfortable with. It's okay if, uh, you know, if, if you're not speaking behind a, a platform, if that's not what you feel uh, is your responsibility. On the other hand, <laughs> you maybe don't try to do everything. It's okay to not be involved in every single ministry because, as Paul said, the feet don't sniff. The feet do their own job. And, of course, that's not to say... You know, you, there's no reason you can't look at someone and, and be encouraged and say, you know what, that person is, is really involved in the ministry and, you know what, maybe, maybe there is a little bit more I can do. Maybe, uh, you know, they're in the youth ministry and, and I think that's something I, I might be good at. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll pray about it and, and give it a try. That's, that's great. Maybe uh, you look at someone and say, you know, I think they would be really a, a really good fit for a Sunday school class or I think they have musical talents and, and they, they may be able to use them. I mean, you can encourage people. You know, I, I think you'd be a good fit for this particular ministry. There's nothing wrong with that either. But again, your hand isn't looking the same way your eyes are. Your feet aren't sniffing. You, individual parts aren't doing everything. They're doing the job that they are called to do. And the problem, we talked about this a little bit earlier, the problem in Corinth, uh, we really see it in, in chapters, uh, the earlier part of chapter 12, and, and then again in chapter 13 and 14, Paul deals with this issue more, is that the Corinthians were placing an undue emphasis 
on spiritual gifts and spiritual abilities and, and their roles in the church. And they are elevating certain members of the church above another. And of course, if we consider when 1 Corinthians is written, it was in the early days of the church, and uh, the Lord often used, um, used people in, in a special way, in ways that he doesn't necessarily use today. Of course, at this time, the New Testament was still being written, and in order to authenticate the gospel message, it would often be accompanied by uh, people who could uh, perform miracles, people who, uh, who could speak in, in a language that they hadn't previously known uh, so as to reach a certain audience. I mean, these things uh, were happening not to overshadow the gospel message or, or the gospel preaching, but to say, you know, this is, this is the truth, this has power, this is, uh, you know, God's plan, and, you know, here's sort of the power in action to show the proof of the message. But in Corinthians, or, or in the, the church at Corinth, there was so much emphasis on the actual gift itself. Uh, you know, we talk about uh, later in, in, in verse 28, you know, God hath set some in the church, uh, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? have all the gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret, but covet earnestly the best gifts, and I'll show unto you a more excellent way. Uh, Paul really had to remind the Corinthians, just because God uses someone to perform a miracle, they're not any more important to the body than somebody who isn't. Uh, just because uh, somebody does speak a, a different language, that doesn't make them any more important or necessary than somebody who doesn't. Just because God has given you a special talent or a special ability or a special gift doesn't make you more important than somebody who doesn't have that gift or, or have that uh, ability. And uh, chapter 12, of course, leads into chapter 13, a, f a very familiar chapter. We, we call it the love uh, chapter. And I mean, in a, yes. Okay, so I thought, uh, <laughs> uh, of course, chapter 13 in, in a nutshell, I mean, it doesn't matter what your talents and skills are if, if you're not doing things in love, if you're not doing things with the right motivation. Uh, but I think a, a really great verse that, uh, sort of encapsulates that idea is in the next chapter, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 12. It says, Even so ye, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. And that ought to be our focus as a member of the body, as, as, a, as a member of the local church, is using our talents and gifts to the glory of God and to the edifying of the church. If you're a foot, do the job of a foot. You know, don't concern yourself with trying to be a hand. You know, if, if, you're, if you're the eyes of the church, and, and obviously like Paul, we're being a bit silly, none of us are eyes or feet, but that's the picture. What's your job in the church, and are you fulfilling that role? I mean, you don't have to be concerned about what this other person is or isn't doing or should be doing or shouldn't be doing or what have you, but what uh, are you doing? Are you fulfilling your role? And, and just sort of as a, as a thought to, to close that out, uh, probably the, uh, the worst thing about this problem that the Corinthians were, were having, and you know, sort of the most uh, egregious thing about, uh, about really their, their pride in, in their spiritual gifts is that it was the spirit who you know, gave them the power to perform miracles or, or speak in tongues or, or heal people or, or what have you. I mean, that's nothing they were doing of their own 
power of their own ability. It's not something they went to school and, and studied for. Uh, but it was a gift that God had given to them and had allowed them to do for the purpose of, you know, spreading the gospel message and building up the church. And instead they were using it as well. You know, I can perform miracles. This person, you know, they can only pray. I speak in tongues and this other person, well, you know, they just sweep the floor. I've never heard them speak in tongues. So, you know, we have to give special preeminence to, oh, these people are doing all of these wonderful things and well, these people are, you know, they're, they're not as important. And again, it's <laughs> that, that, that wasn't even their own gifts or ability. And I mean, uh, you know, like us, it, it's, it's God who, who gives us even just the, uh, the breath to, uh, to come here uh, tonight. So it, it is a warning against being just uh, a little too proud of the abilities that he, he does give us. But as we just move on to, to the next section... Uh, just a short one beginning in verse 25. We'll see that there are many members, but one experience. And, and what we mean by that, have you ever stubbed your toe? Like your pinky toe, which is probably that big, it, it, it hurts. And <laughs> you feel it through your whole body. And if you've ever had a toothache, your, your tooth is even smaller probably than, than your pinky toe. But if you get a toothache, you're, you're miserable all over. The pain isn't just in your tooth. It, just, it goes through your whole body, it feels like. If you've ever bit your lip, I, I get canker sores. And they're, they're probably about this big, but like, it's, they make me miserable. They're, they're terrible. And like... A body. If if one member suffers, the whole body should feel that. Uh, of course, a uh, very familiar verse in Romans twelve, fifteen through sixteen says, "Rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind, one toward another." Just a similar verse uh, in Galatians: "Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill." the law of Christ. If, if one member of the body is, is celebrating, we should, we should be celebrating with them. We should feel glad if, you know, sister so-and-so or, 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 you know, brother watch his face, if they're having, you know, something worth being excited about and they're, they're celebrating and things are going well, we should be rejoicing with them and uh, the the converse of that is true. When members in the body are hurting or uh, are having facing struggles or, or challenges, you know, we should feel that as a body. We should, again, rejoice with those that rejoice, weep with them that weep. And that wasn't what, of course, uh, we, the Corinthian, the book of Corinthians is sort of a guide of what the Corinthians were doing, do the opposite. Don't do what they were doing. But they weren't rejoicing with those who rejoiced. They weren't weeping with those who weeped. Uh, 1 Corinthians eleven eighteen. Paul says, For first of all, when you come together in, in the church, I hear there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. Paul said, Yep, I, I've heard rumors that uh, there's divisions in the church that uh, this person doesn't talk to this person, that this group doesn't uh, mingle with this group. And you know what? I believe it because I've seen what you are like. And that's not how uh, members of the body should behave. We should be uh, in sync and, and, and with, with one another. Uh, an Old Testament reference, Psalm 133, 1. It says, Behold... How good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. That was uh, a verse that uh, we often used in, uh, uh, back in college. If uh, uh, things were going astray, I mean, you put seven or eight guys together in a room, sometimes things went sideways. Uh, sometimes things went sideways really fast. Uh, so we actually had that verse one year printed out and put where 
everybody could see it because it was a good reminder that it's better to dwell in unity than to dwell in disunity. And I mean, I'm sure you've been in the situation and there's nothing worse where uh, this person is mad at this person and this person is avoiding this person and this person is gossiping about this other person. And that's not how the body should behave. Uh, Weston uh, preached uh, just the other night, uh, if you were here, from the, uh, the prodigal son. I mean, that's an example. He was not rejoicing with those who uh, were rejoicing. His, his wayward brother came home, and uh, rather than be excited about it and rather than rejoice with his father and, and join the party, he was angry and he was sullen and he was... Uh, out uh, sucking in the field and, and he was upset and he you know well how come you know I'm the good faithful son and you know my wayward brothers come home and he gets all of this lavished on him and it's 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 not fair again it's a bad example not what we should be doing as members of the body and I think it comes to when we think of that, I mean, how, how do we feel when we see others receive recognition? I mean, do we sometimes feel, well, I do this and this and this, and this other person doesn't do all that, but how come they get special recognition? How come they get, oh, you know, they get noticed more than my efforts do? And that shouldn't be where we're at either, again. We should be in sync. We should be uh, doing our own role, not being concerned with what everybody else is doing or is not doing. We should want Christians to, uh, to succeed. I mean, we should, be, uh, we should rejoice when we see other believers and, and those in the body doing well. And, uh, I mean, this is uh, you know, the kind of thing that, you know, uh, really we shouldn't... Uh, I mean, we shouldn't need the reminder, but unfortunately, we do sometimes. And, you know, a large part of being in sync as a body and, and, and just uh, that togetherness is what we do on Wednesday nights when we, when we come together to, to pray. Uh, and that's a, <laughs> that's a perfect segue to, uh, uh, to the close of the message, I think. When we do come together to pray, it's not, uh, I mean, it's not just a time waster. It's not, well, we have another 10 minutes left and we need to do something, so I guess we'll take prayer request. It's, you know, when we pray for another and when we share our prayer request, it's a way of bearing one another's burdens. It's a way of, of rejoicing with those who rejoice. It's a way of weeping uh, with those who weep. And it's a way of just being aware of, uh, well, you know, this person is, is having this struggle or this person is having this health need or, or this person just, uh, you know, they got this promotion at work or they just uh, uh, had this successful uh, thing happen or the Lord's blessed them. Uh, in this way, and when we share those prayer requests and when we share uh, time together and even just, you know, fellowshipping as, as believers, and of course, uh, during COVID, uh, you know, most of us got used to watching online services, and, and certainly that's better than, than, than nothing, but uh, you're not getting the, the same fellowship. You're not able to bear one another's burdens as easily when you're not talking with people, when you're not uh, sharing prayer requests when you're not, uh, you know, hearing what people are going through, uh, whether it's it's good or bad. Uh, so we'll uh, we'll close the message out there, and we will take uh, a couple of moments just for uh, some prayer requests. We'll start. Uh, I guess we'll start over on this side. Yes.